in the 1500s, there was a debate that came up with Lutherans about whether original sin was part of the substance of humanity or accidental to human nature. What does that mean? Okay, so we have this distinction between substance and accidents that comes up in Aristotle. And a substance is the thing that is proper to something that actually makes it what it is. And an accident is something that doesn't necessarily affect what a thing is. So let's give an, an illustration of that, for example. I am a human, right? So what belongs to the substance of my humanity? Well, I have DNA, mm -hmm. right? I can't be a human without DNA. We, we just don't exist without it, right? Mm -hmm. So you could say that DNA belongs to the substance of my humanity. Now, on the other side, I have a fake elbow, right? Okay. I fell a few years ago when I was running, shattered my elbow. They had to replace it. Is that part of the substance of humanity to have a fake elbow? No, not every human has a fake elbow. A lot of you are doing just fine with your normal elbows. <laughs> I was doing just fine while I had a normal elbow until I broke it, right? And so this, this fake elbow that I have is not part of the substance. It's not what makes me a human. It's accidental. I can have a real elbow. I can have a fake elbow. I'm still a person, right? So the question is, does, is original sin uh, substance or accident when it comes to humanity? And this has real implications for the Christian. Right? Because if original sin or sin generally is part of your substance, then that means you can never be a human apart from original sin. So when I get raised on the last day, for example, right, I, I die and then Jesus raises me up, am I still going to have sin? Well, if sin is part of the substance of humanity, if it's part of what makes me a human, if Jesus wants to raise me up as a human, then I'm still going to have sin on the last day and in the kingdom of God. Well, that doesn't sound right, does it? Right? And, and so the, the Lutheran Church eventually comes out in the formula of Concord, and it has an article on this, this debate on original sin, and it says, look, you, the original sin is not part of the substance of humanity. Now, they have various reasons that they don't necessarily want you to talk about it as accidental, too, because they think that these terms just aren't necessarily the way that we need to go in this kind of discussion. But they say very clearly, it's not right to say that sin is part of your substance. Mm. It is not right to say that sin is just who you are. Mm -hmm. Because if that's the case, then Jesus is actually going to redeem sin. He's actually going to raise you up as a sinner and bring you into his kingdom as a sinner. And that's not the way this works, mm -hmm. right? Jesus is here to put your sin to death and to raise you up as a righteous person who has no sin left in you anymore so that you can live in a kingdom without any sin, without any death, without any of that stuff. Um, so that's what the Lutheran confessions are saying. Now, fast forward to the year 2024, when you have someone who may very well come up to you and say, you know, pastor, my son is in a ro romantic relationship with another man. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to do about that because, uh, this romantic relationship with another man, the Bible tells me that's sin, mm -hmm. right? If I read St. Paul's letter to the Romans, for example, I know that that's not what God wants, but you know, that's who he is. Mm -hmm. That's a part of him, right? And so how can I not support him if this, if this relationship, if this attraction, if this romantic relationship is actually who he is, if it's part of his nature, if it's part of his substance, then what am I supposed to do about that? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So the formula of Concord has not given you the whole, you know, explanation of what you're supposed to do in that situation. But I think it's pretty evident that it's given us a good start, right? It's at least given us a place to say, actually, that sinful attraction that your son has or whoever, you know, your friend, whoever it is that you have, maybe, you know, you as the Christian who's struggling with this attraction, that is not you. Mm -hmm. That's not who you are. That is sin that is part of us ever since the fall, right? It, it has corrupted our nature, but it's not who you are. Jesus has come to redeem you from that. Mm -hmm. He has come to put that to death in you and to actually raise you up as a new person and to raise you up on the last day as such a person who doesn't experience that kind of desire anymore. Um, and so that the, the confessions give us a really helpful beginning of our explanation for this kind of 2024 kind of problem. Yeah. Uh, in a way that, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't know that history, right, if you didn't know what was going on in the Formula of Concord and its article on original sin, in essence, you would kind of be in the situation of having to remake the wheel. Mm -hmm. You would be trying to start from scratch, and you don't have to, it turns out. We've, we've dealt with a lot of this stuff already in a way that is uh, 
in, is aligned with the scriptural witness and what our Lord Jesus and his apostles and the prophets have taught. And so let's let's start with that and we'll save ourselves a lot of trouble. Yeah, which goes back to kind of the, the example we talked about earlier where when someone poses a question, you know, if you're stuck giving straw man arguments, that's that's not going to help very often, right? So if, mm-hmm. if you don't if you don't have some kind of root that you have inherited and you can go back to, you know, that this is a potent example, right? Mm-hmm. Then you might flounder in there and you might go, well, you know, it, you might be able to say God says it's bad. You know, many will just say, okay, yeah, good point. That's him, right? But even for yeah. those that would that would say that would give the right answer but give the wrong reason for why, they might say, no, God. God says that's a sin. And if they, that's good. But if they stop there, that person's going to go home and they're going to say, you know, that wasn't a reasonable argument. I haven't been convinced of anything. And I'm not saying if you give the right answer that everyone's going to be convinced. But at least in the example you've given, you've given a strong answer that's rooted in great thinkers that have gone before you that are all rooted in a good scriptural teaching and thinking through these kind of things in a very deep way. That is a potent uh, way to communicate with people as they ask these challenging questions that make you think about, do, should we really confess this, right? And the answer is yes, and here's the reasons why. 